Welcome, everybody. Um, Greg Hain and Ryan Groth here, and uh, this is our fourth episode of the Unlocking Service Growth show, program, uh, you name it. Uh, we are excited to bring on a special guest today. And uh, for those of you who are trickling in, um, this is an, a, a program that Greg and I put together that is identified as a program to help you grow service in your business. Primarily roofing contractors are on this call, but any service business who wants to grow their commercial service department and that business is should be here. So Greg and I both bring unique perspectives and insights to this, uh, to this effort to grow service. And each time we try to bring a special guest who can give you just some wonderful insights, wisdom from their perspective on how the industry can improve. So we're really excited to have a special guest today. Uh, but if you guys do not know, uh, please follow Greg Hain on uh, LinkedIn and social media and get in his email list. Greg Hain is a fantastic uh, peer group facilitator, and he has wonderful insights and a program to help you grow service specifically online called uh, Creating Great Service. And if you guys haven't purchased that yet, you're missing out. And so uh, if you guys don't know me, I'm a sales trainer, sales coach. We have a sales platform to help contractors grow and uh, their business from all different types of business models. But we definitely have unique insights on helping grow commercial roofing businesses in their sales departments. And we're proud to uh, see some wonderful clients in the industry doing great things together. So that is us. Uh, Greg, um, if you don't haven't met Greg yet, this is Greg Hain, my co-host and comrade here on the Unlocking Service Growth Program. Greg, would you like to just say hey to the group and uh, introduce our, our special guest today? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not looking at the attendee list right now. I don't know how many of you are here because of Ryan and how many of you are here because of me. That, But for those of you that are here because of me that do not yet um, have a relationship with Ryan, I want to I want to be clear with you that um, if you want to get better at service, you're going to need to have some sales skills. And the place to go for that is Ryan. Ryan is not good. Ryan is exceptional. He really is. Um, it's just every, and, and he's become a friend of mine um, over the last few years. And it's been rewarding for me that we've been able to do this kind of collaboration. We have a very unique and special guest today. As we were starting this process of putting this um, uh, podcast together, I said, you know, we need to bring in someone that would be the ideal customer for a commercial roofing contractor. And because I have been a roofing consultant over the years, I know a lot of these people. And there's one person in particular that I would like to invite. And then, and, and, as, and he is, his first name is Frank, and we are not sharing with you his last name, and we are not sharing with you the company uh, for whom he works because we do not want you to try to find out who he is, bug him, and try to do business with him. He is being very gracious. He has is, he is responded to my invitation out of his friendship with me, and I do not want to abuse that. So don't try to find out who Frank is, please. Okay. Now, having said that, <clears throat> um, Frank and I have chatted a little bit, and Frank wanted to share, was kind of off the cuff, how we met. And I think that would be appropriate. So, Frank, go. Yeah, so it was, uh, I think, 16, 17 years ago. And uh, I, I worked at that time for the same company that I work for now. And um, the, the company was really just getting started. We're, we're now up to about 90 properties. At that time, I think we had... 10 or 15 and, and Greg somehow got through the screener and uh, was talking to one of our, our other asset managers and I could hear them talking and I could tell that she was going to pass him off to me and I'm thinking okay how am I going to get rid of this person and uh, we talked for there was something he said early in the conversation that was different and um, so I, I listened and we ended up talking for an hour and in the course of that hour, he, he asked me uh, to tell him about my, my biggest problem, which was a shopping center that was 900 miles from where I was sitting at the time. It was brand new and, and it was just leaking like crazy every time it, every time it uh, rained. And uh, Greg said that, that he would fix it. 
he would never leave his office and he wouldn't charge me for it. And I thought, okay, what do I have to lose? And uh, he did it. Um, curiously enough, he, he did it. He, he asked me for blueprints for the building and he asked for permission to speak to the guy who was in charge of building it. And um, I wasn't sure I could get either one, but I was able to get both. And within three weeks, he had solved the problem. I'll never forget when he was talking to the construction supervisor, he asked me if there were field changes. And uh, he said, yes. And, and Greg asked him some questions about the field changes. And it got silent <laughs> on the other end of the phone. And then the guy says, oh. <laughs> so problem solved. I, I don't know how long it would have taken us to, to ever solve that problem. I doubt that a roofer would have ever found it. Um, but certainly, uh, we, we got to the bottom of the problem uh, months before we would have. And uh, that was the beginning of a relationship that, that grew quickly uh, from that point on. And it's intact to this day. So thank you. I do remember that well. Um, <laughs> But I want to share with the group why um, I invited you. Uh, Frank is one of the three best asset proper, property managers, asset managers, whatever you want to label, you want to put on that, that I've ever worked with. That puts me third. <laughs> no. <laughs> one of three. Okay. <laughs> and one of the things that Frank does extremely well is... Um, he teaches, he taught me things. Now he didn't, he didn't necessarily teach me, like set me down, but I learned things from him. And there's one thing that I learned from him toward the beginning of our relationship that struck me so strongly that I want to share with you today, because this is the key, in my opinion, why you need to pay attention to everything else that's coming out of his mouth today. Frank and I were working on a different problem at a different shopping center that I also didn't go to visit, um, to my knowledge. Uh, I don't even remember what center it was, but um, we were having a problem. I got a roofer involved, a good roofer, and we, with, with help with the roofer, we figured out what was going on, and I'm all ready to pull the trigger on making this problem go away. And Frank said to me, he said, yeah, we can't do this yet, or something to that effect. And I said, okay, fine, why? And a and something came up in the course of what was happening with this property that was going to influence what we did to the roof. And it became apparent that we had to talk to the roofer and tell him, hey, buddy, we're going to have to put you in timeout for a little bit. And I said, well, we'll just tell him that we're going to put it in the budget for next year or something. It was a white lie. It was just a little white lie. And Frank said to me, no. We can't say that because it's not strictly the truth. We have to say the truth. And then he and I spent more time on the phone figuring out how we could frame, because the roofer had no business knowing what's going on on this property. So Frank and I figured out a way to talk to the roofer to give him the gift, to put him in timeout without him feeling abused and without telling a little white lie. And the lesson that I learned from that, that I have, that has stuck with me to this day is you never even tell the white lie. You always find a way to tell the truth. Frank has as high of integrity of anybody I've worked with. And he's number one in that regard. If he's number three on the other, he's number one on that. So please when he talks about things, understand you're talking to the best of the best. Now, having said that, and we get, had gone this, to this mutual admiration, Ryan, why don't you start with some questions for Frank? Sure. So, um, so Frank, you know, we, we find that a lot of the contractors we work with, when they start to work with more experienced managers of properties, of larger properties, they start to notice that uh, the resistance wall is a little harder and higher to climb and get through. They find um, they find that we, we kind of call this a term uh, professional buyer. 
we like to call that a term a professional buyer like people like you sometimes can make the the, the prospect of the roofer feel that you know they're they're really subservient in a sense or they're um like it's just hard to get to and you guys uh have your walls up right and so what we do is we try to coach on how to lower that and how to position yourself in a way that uh gets you out of that category in their mind as somebody that can try to get rid of as fast as possible get to, to a conversation that's actually valuable you know to, to you uh as the property manager and so we we coach to that and one thing that we find is we try to we find that when we are actually having good conversations that add value to you it, it changes the way you perceive that contractor in hopes that there's this relationship that could form that you feel like you have a roofing partner versus um, somebody who is somebody else, like a roofing vendor, right? So I'm, I'm curious, has, has that relationship, has somebody ever earned the right, other than Greg, actually a contractor, a roofer, uh, earn the right of, you're somebody as a trusted advisor for me, and I want to I feel consulted and collaborating with on your properties or, or do you feel like that's been a rare thing to, to experience in your career with a roofing contractor? I would say it's rare and uh, candidly, I don't know if there's been a roofer that, that came outside of Greg's recommendation um, that ever achieved that, that level with me. Um, roofing is a tiny portion of what I deal with and I'm no expert what what I what I know about roofing is that um, it's very hit or miss as far as when when we try to for example solve a leak or extend the life of, of a roof uh, it's very challenging and um, sometimes we talk to the right people that know what they're doing in my opinion more often than not we're, we're talking to someone who is guessing. Mm. Um, e even when I'm talking to roofers, I, I feel like, and this might not be correct, it might not be right, but that's based on my experience. Um, you know, unless, unless, <laughs> and, and I, I don't know how else to say this, unless Greg tells me this guy knows what he's doing, I, generally presume that I have no choice but to presume that they don't mm. Mm. They, they know what they're doing but they 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 might miss the mark because it's a it's a it's a messy business um, it's oftentimes hard to get it right I've I've been on the roof with guys trying to find leaks I've lived that dream and it's <laughs> I can't imagine how anyone would ever find any leak and so um, that's part of the challenge Frank, you said that <clears throat> leaks are and roofing is a very small part of what you do. And um, would you share with us a little bit about what you do do on a daily basis? Uh, yeah, I'll try. I, I've never been able to really describe it, I don't think. Um, but I'll I'll put it this way. Um, I'll, I'll go through. I've, I've worked on this. And, and I'll say that um, I have a couple of direct, this is me personally. Um, I have a couple direct reports uh, who are also asset managers that, that manage multiple properties in other markets. I also have properties that I manage directly myself. Um, and, and they're in, like I'm, I'm in Dallas. Uh, I have properties in Houston. I have properties in Austin. I have properties in Wilmington, North Carolina, one in, in Augusta, Georgia. So they're spread out. Right now I'm in Las Vegas. Um, we, we were yesterday in Salt Lake City. I have indirectly properties in Oklahoma, Arizona. And so, um, and that, that sounds like a lot just by itself. Uh, I will say that, that getting into some specifics, you know, this last year, the, it's all about AR, collecting rents. Um, of course, with businesses closed for a few months, uh, business soft for many months, it's been all about uh, staying close to our tenants, monitoring tenant health, trying to understand tenants' ability to pay and collections and, and trying to figure out who we're going to lose 
uh, who, who do we need to replace um, to occupy our shopping centers and pay us rent? Um, you know, part of the, part of the, another challenge this past year is deal with signs. So signs, any sign on a shopping center is either directly or indirectly. We have control over it. Tenant signs that are above their stores, uh, curbside pickup signs in the parking lot. You know, we are open signs in the common areas. Signs took a lot of our attention uh, this past year. Uh, we, we do property inspections. So I need to do property inspections for every property that I manage directly once a quarter. Uh, night inspections and day inspections. The properties that are in my market need to be done every month. I'm looking at lighting, cleaning, porter, sweeping, um, security, landscaping, parking lots, retention ponds, fire life safety, uh, backflow inspections. We, we meet with every one of our tenants twice a year. Uh, so, I, so I interact with the, the people in the stores directly. I document those interactions. My documents, my documentation of those interactions go to other people in the organization, which helps us manage those relationships. Uh, I'm responsible for sales reporting. All the tenants report their sales. That's how we monitor their health. We do property budgets. We reforecast those budgets every month. Uh, we have five-year enhancement uh, programs for each, each property. We deal with insurance claims, incident reports. Uh, recently, we completed a project in our portfolio. of we, we have about 230 vendors throughout our portfolio. I don't deal with all of them. I deal with almost half of those. And we've restructured all those contracts so that the next time there's a pandemic, we can peel off services quickly uh, in order it to react. So, um, so th this is wonderful. Because well, and, and let me just say, let me just finish ahead, with this. Please. There's different people that have my job in, in different capacities, different roles. Um, but at the end of the day, my role is an expense to be minimized. That's we are a necessary evil in the industry, much like, you know, roofing has expenses and people that you don't want to have that expense, but you have no choice. And, and, and the goal is to minimize it. So regardless of the role of any person in my role, uh, whether they're just starting out or whether they've been in it for a while, they have more than they can possibly do. And, and, and they're left with trying to prioritize as best they can. So when you have a roof leak, you just want it to go away. I want it to go away and I, and I want to manage the relationship with the tenant who has that leak. And there's different types of tenants. You know, there's the, the, the large national, there's the regional, there's the mom and pop. And generally they, they have different goals in reporting that leak. Some are um, meritorious, some are not. And uh, our job is to solve the problem, solve the leak, um, but also manage the relationship. Um, so go, go ahead, ahead, Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I, I was just I was just gonna ask um what what the how challenging is it or how long does it take to replace a tenant relationship if and when it severed and they move on or something happens, perhaps caused by the leak or just the building in general, but let's just say the leak had something to do with it. But regardless of, of, of the, the reason, they, they left, right? How, and it's about collecting money, it's about AR, it's about keeping, keeping the revenue coming in. What's that like for you to lose a regional, to lose a mom and pop, to lose a national? How, how hard is it? Does it take a long time? What's the impact of tenants' relationships not um, being strong? I would say best case, you're, you're, you, you might replace that tenant in under a year. Um, worst case, it could be many years. Um, it, it's all a function of the real estate. Rarely will a roof leak cause a tenant to leave. The, the, the function of our ability to replace a tenant is driven by the value of the real estate. Sometimes we want to replace a tenant. Sometimes we want them out of there because we can do better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's something that we're always cognitive of and, and, and managing. Who do we want to keep? Who do we want to get rid of? 
um, and and the relationship management that that roof leak is is part of the the, the larger picture. Um, but know that when we replace a tenant, typically what comes with that is a is a what we call a TI package, tenant incentive package. So we are putting money into the deal. Not only are we giving up our space, our real estate, we are investing in the new tenant. And it, and it could be a hundred thousand, it could be over a million. And so to answer your question, it's always best for us to retain tenants, um, especially at renewal time, because mm -hmm. we're not having to, to put money into a new build out in order to yeah, there's the money that you put in and then the, the, the loss of the revenue not coming in and then right. that time of it being about a year, it could be a, but, but you're saying rarely is roofing the cause of them leaving, right? It's a uh, correct. Um, go ahead, Greg. <clears throat> Although that might not be the case in other organizations because in Frank's organization, they take care of the roofs. Correct. Um, often though, when a new tenant moves into a space, when we lose someone and somebody else comes in, sometimes there's a new roof that comes as a part of that deal also. Correct. That can happen. That can and happen. And often there can be tenant improvements that are done to the roof where they rip out a whole bunch of mechanical equipment and put a bunch of new mechanical equipment in and punch a whole bunch of holes in the roof in the process that the roofer then has to, to sort out. Right. So, so let's pretend the new roof uh, is, is part of the, the TI package, or let's just pretend it's time. Um, let's talk about new roofs. I know we're talking about service as well quite a bit, but have you ever spent and paid a little bit more to work with a roofer that Greg recommended? Um, have you ever spent more to work with somebody if you had, and, and, and how's your decision process typically look? When choosing um, someone to work with, like roofing, for example, what's your what's your decision process, and have you ever spent more than the bottom, than the low bid to uh, to proceed in choosing a contractor? You know, the every every asset manager's there's going to be a lot of different answers to this question. My my answer to that question is that um, I worked with Greg for many years. We did pay more. Uh, when working with Greg um, than we otherwise wise might uh, because Greg knew we wanted, we wanted quality work. I will say we, we do not uh, work with Greg in the way that we used to. In fact, we are not, the, the relationship has uh, for the last few years, uh, my relationship with Greg is distant. I will say we've, we've, our, um, company has moved a different direction I would say we now pay more um, again it's 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 because we want the problem solved um, first know, Greg, time the right way right first time the right way and um, we, we, we're, we're, we're viewing it from a, a slightly different perspective um, I, the, the perspective might be right, might be wrong, but at the end of the day, I would say to solve an individual leak, there could be no doubt. We might be paying double now than what we did when we had Greg, but um, the, the thought is we still find value in doing that because we're not spending time over and over and over again trying to solve the same problem couple more questions here aside from the leak not coming back uh which is the indicator of it working is there anything else that you could say this is a you need to do this standard for a for a service provider and particularly a roofer um that makes you realize that value versus uh the don'ts like for example is there a certain type of reporting that you just like if you don't even see a minimum type reporting, you don't even give it a look because you know it's going to be subpar versus what you know is the standard of value that you uh, expect. Other than, of course, the roof leak going away, what else can you see that would provide evidence to you that you're in that place of this is quality and they know what they're talking about versus uh, the don'ts, which is, you know, you're, you're, you guys aren't in that category. It's evident based on what I'm seeing or not seeing here. 
the documentation and that supports the invoice is, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking to see, does, does it, is it consistent with my understanding of the league as it was reported? Um, you know, are those, are those, is the work that's being done, is it documented in a way that makes sense? Um, based do you on, like on detail, do you like more, more detail? Do you like it summarized? And as long as it's <clears throat> understandable for you, just curious. Um, um, it depends. We, we, in most shopping centers, um, actually are reimbursed our roof related expenses and and there's two mechanisms for that uh one is what we call cam common area maintenance all, all the expenses that are associated with maintaining the shopping centers every year are reconciled and roofing is a part of that um and 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 then it's billed back to the tenants based on their proportionate share of the square footage of the shopping center some tenants don't necessarily pay into CAM um, or, or the amount that they pay into CAM doesn't, doesn't modulate based on our expenses. And some tenants, the, the large players, when they see a reference, a detail reference in an invoice that mentions another tenant, they'll just refuse to pay it. Not that they have the right to do that. They just, we can't fight it. Um, so, so one mechanism and the most effective mechanism to recover our expenses is through CAM. That's how we refer to bill it. And in those cases, oftentimes less detail can be better. You know, we don't want references to tenant names uh, oftentimes when we bill back to uh, through CAM. Um, the other way we bill back is through what we call bill back. And, and that's more generally aimed to someone that's abusing uh, a situation. So maybe they're emitting a bunch of grease on the roof. Maybe they're HVAC contractors punching holes in the roof. They're, they're, they're calling us for what we know is HVAC problems and they are responsible for the HVAC problems. When we're gonna build back, we want detail. We want specifics. We want the tenant name. We want it shown exactly what, what it is that they haven't done and why we're billing them back. We don't like to bill back directly because oftentimes the tenant won't pay. Our ability to recover that bill back is, is challenging, but it, it does provide us an opportunity to send a message to that tenant as part of managing that relationship. Mm -hmm. So in one case, we want every detail we could possibly need to point the finger at that tenant. And then and in the other case, we don't want the detail that, that would cause another tenant to not pay. And, and oftentimes when we're dispatching a roofer, we don't know which one we want. We, we, it, it comes in the documentation side. Oh, well, we need to delete this reference. We need to delete that reference. We need to add this or add that. Um, and, and that oftentimes just becomes more of a hassle than it's worth. That, that, uh, it makes me think contractors should ask, you know, on this specific one, would you like a lot or a little detail for this case to help you, right? Because I think that might be valuable, save some, save some headache. Oftentimes we, we have an idea when the call comes in because, yeah. you know, you try to ask the general questions. Where, where is it leaking? Um, you know the tenant, you know the type. So you have an idea. And would you consider yourself a proactive manager with your roofing services specifically and go proactively trying to get out in front of leaks and and like that pre preventative proactive approach or do you would you consider yourself more of like hey when it's leaking i know i know where it is and who maybe who's responsible come in let me call you come out and fix it what would you say you would more reactively managing leaks or proactively i would say we're more proactive than than average on um, average, yeah. On yeah. average, industry wide, you're probably on more of the proactive side. Probably more proactive side. Okay, and uh, I think I have one more for for uh, Frank for now, Greg. Um, thank you, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know it takes a lot of time to secure the relationship with the tenant, right? And then you, you, it takes a lot of trust to secure that relationship, vendor partnership with the roofing contractor. Um, what would it take? for that relationship to be, to, to fail, 
like for with a roofer, like um, what would have to happen for you to say, okay, like if I'm a roofer and I'm talking to you and you clearly have a relationship with somebody else, when do I have a hole to potentially engage business with you? Okay. What would have to happen with that? Like when, when do you see it? Like, Hey, I'm starting to max out their capacity. I could tell that they're a little busy. Like when does it, when is there room for, for other potential partners to come in and, um, and, and solve problems with you? I'm not sure I'm clear on the question. I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it. Um, in, in, in my case, generally, if, if, if I have reason to trust that roofer in the first place, whether it's because Greg told me I should mm -hmm. or someone else that I trust told me I should, you can, you can, you can have some problems and get away with it. Right. Um, but it's, it's that, it's that reoccurring, you know, the, the documentation, the information that doesn't tie to, to what I know and, 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 and what I know might be accurate. It might be valid. It might not be, but it's what I think I know. And when there's a disconnect and that happens three times, I'm, I'm pretty concerned and I'm kind of focused yeah, on paying the, attention. The pattern of three is like, okay, my radar's up. Officially. My radar's up. When we get to five, I'm for sure looking for somebody. I'm looking for an alternative. Yeah, because, you know, um, I would imagine if a good contractor is working with you and they trust you trust them, they're probably getting other people to trust them too. And they're doing a good job. And, and I know Greg is very concerned with being able to service what you sell and be able to actually keep up because it took so much energy and quality to earn that right. And then you have the three to five kind of um, occurrences, but they may not be telling you, hey, Frank, what we're just so far out. I don't know if we can address this one. They're going to tell you they can do it, right? So um, I'm just thinking about as, as a contractor is growing and they're working with more accounts, um, how, those, how those leverage points could could take place in a conversation for them to prove to you and uh, start to earn more of your business and uh, essentially fire the other roofer at some point. So um, I like that answer. The three, three is the radar's up and five it's over, right? It's like I would, I, I would add to that based on you know, the comments you just made. It, it would, it would worry me when they say, Oh yeah, I can solve your problem. <laughs> that That's a, that's a red flag <laughs> uh, because even the best. I mean, you're, you're, there are times when you're going to miss mm. and, um, and, and there might be times when you're going to miss more than once. So, so the person that tells me, yeah, I can solve your problem. I get it right. The first. No. I don't so you appreciate it. when a, when a representative of the business just takes a minute to ask some clarifying questions before saying they can fix it. Do you appreciate that discovery process a little bit just to really get to it? If they, if they, in my opinion, if, if, if they're shooting straight and I, and I'm going to trust them, um, they have to admit that it's an imperfect science and they might not get it right the first time. I hope that's really relieving for everybody because it means you just being honest is helpful. And, uh, and yeah, that's good. Appreciate that. That's, I think, super helpful for our group. Frank and I had a conversation many years ago where we were dealing with one of these things. And I remember that distinctly because Frank said, I really don't care if they fix it the first try or not, as long as I know what they're doing and they keep me informed. Mm -hmm. And that's through the documentation process. When we would get invoices that were well-documented and we knew what was done and how it was done, then it's one thing when we would get invoices where we have no idea what was done and we call and say, what's going on here? And we can't get answers. It doesn't take three for the red flag to go up. <laughs> it takes one for yeah. the red flag to go up. It's good. Greg, do you have any uh, questions? I'm, I'm <laughs> almost out. I'm yeah. sure I can come up with more. Yeah. But. <laughs> so, I know that I've been listening to this and, and I think you did a great job of asking questions, Ryan. Um, Frank, you talked at the beginning about 
um, how our relationship developed. You said I said something and somebody in the chat asked me what it was that I said and I don't even remember and I don't expect you to. But what the, the question I would ask you is this, when someone is reaching out to you, whether it's a roofer or whoever it is, and they're trying to get your attention, what is it that you're looking for? Or what is it that is a warning sign? Either way, what is like, oh my, this is, and you've kind of alluded to that a little bit already of like, oh, we'll get the leak the first time kind of a deal. But what, what sorts of stuff do you hear that is a complete turn off? What sort of stuff gets your attention? I would say, let me, let me first answer the turnoff. So, so sometimes I'll get calls from people that clearly um, just don't, don't have the experience. They don't, I mean, to be a good roofer, you, you, you've got to have years and, and not five years, probably not 10 years you, you, to talk to someone that knows what they're doing. It's 15 or 20. And, um, you know, when I get, when I get solicited by someone that's not old enough to have 15 or 20 years experience. And when I ask them questions, they have no idea. It's, it's a waste of my time. Um, you know, that, that guy with, or gal with 20 years experience is not the one who's going to be spending time calling me <laughs> generally. It's, um, so, you know, what, what, what I think, and I don't remember what it was that, Greg, that, that you said, but I, I think uh, it, it was evidence to me that, uh, first of all, you, you listened to my concerns um, and, and the responses that you gave evidenced that you were listening to me. And, and you also evidenced that you had knowledge uh, in the way that you chose to respond. The deal, the, the deal sealer was your, your willingness to put yourself out there, no risk to me. So the, the commitment that you would fix this from Iowa, I'm in, you know, I'm, I'm somewhere in the Midwest. My problem is in Texas. You're going to fix it from Iowa. You're never going to go there and it's not going to cost me anything. Yeah, right. Okay. And two weeks later, you've done it. So, all right, so if a, if, if, if a roofer calls you on the phone and I'm, I'm gonna put my roofer hat on and if, if a roofer calls you on the phone and, they, and they're trying to establish a relationship with you and they say something to you along the lines of, you know, uh, Frank, <clears throat> um, you've got a lot of properties. Certainly there are, you've got some locations, some places where you're having more problems than others. If you're having a problem that your current roofer is not getting solved for you right now, we'll be glad to go out and look at it for you and fix it. And if we can't fix it, you don't have to pay us. If we do fix it, then we'll, we'll bill you at our normal rate. Would, would that be fair? Is that something that's going to be appealing to you? In my current situation, I don't have all the control over who we choose as our roofer. If I'm in a situation where I have control, yes, that's a, that's a, that's a, again, what do I have to lose? And um, it, there's value in someone even willing to, to put their time and effort into proving that they know what they're talking about. That, that offer structured in that way if they don't know what they're doing, they're not going to make that offer. <clears throat> so let, let's, let's switch away from service to projects for a second. We have re-roofed many buildings together over the years. And in my role as consultant, one of the things I've always tried to do is prolong the life of a roof as long as I can in a cost-effective way. But if, let's say you don't have a consultant, there's no, there's no Greg, okay? And your current situation is not what it is now, so this is just you that have to handle this. And you have a problem roof, the contractor calls you and he makes the, and yeah, we're having this problem with this roof. And he, if he comes back to you and says to you, you know, if you want to replace this roof, fine, but I think there might be ways that you could extend the life of this roof by doing repairs instead of replacing the roof. Would that in general 
get your attention. Would mine. Yeah. Okay. I think there's others yeah. in my situation, maybe, <laughs> maybe not as much, but it would mine. Well, you know, one of the things that we go through with contractors occasionally is this idea of, do you want to work for somebody that's a professional or do you want to work for amateurs? And they, they all want to work for professionals, which is what you are. And a lot of times some of the others are not as concerned about that, but there's other problems when you deal with them, because those are also the people that just want a cheap price. So um, we've had some questions that come in and um, one of the questions that's come in that I thought was uh, a really good question is, and, and thinking about this kind of overall, um, is there value to you when a contractor can come to you and he can help you not only with roofing, but also vertical waterproofing? The, the brick walls leak or the foundation is leaking and water is coming up through the floor to, to to an example that you and I both can relate to. All right. Yeah. If, if, if you have one contractor that can handle all of that, is there value to the, you in that big time? Okay. So, um, <clears throat> say more about that. Those people are hard to find. They're, uh, you know, you don't, you, you don't oftentimes don't know. Is it, is it the roof or is it something else? And you, you can have one vendor that might be skillful in one, which is the roof. Very rarely will you find anyone that will pretend to be skillful in the other, which is wall leaks or floor leaks. Um, to, to deal with someone that can deal with both, that's, I, I don't know that I've ever like a unicorn like it's like a unicorn great great description <laughs> and um you know part of it part of it is the the report that we get uh, as described by the tenant part of the problem is is the description you know what the tenant is seeing they think it's a wall leak they think it's a floor leak but that's because they don't really know what they're they're looking at they don't they don't understand the, the construction of the building. They don't understand, you know, how this leak is evidencing itself that it that it might be the roof when in fact it's not coming in, in from the roof. Um, on the flip side, we, we deal with a lot of water penetration problems that are not the roof, and it's extremely difficult to find people that that uh, will even try to deal with those kinds of problems how, how how often do you find a roofer saying hey frank i don't think this is a roof problem may i recommend i'd like to recommend somebody who i think could solve this he's a different trade i think this is a different area um, do you feel like roofers or other contractors are actually referring trusted partners that they believe could help you um or do they just say, you know, they, they try to pretend, right? And fake it. I, I'm not trying to maybe get a percentile here, but how, um, so I don't think a lot of our contractors do a good enough job of this. I don't think that they say, hey, let me refer somebody. This is something I can't actually fix and honestly tell you the truth and then refer somebody who can help. Um, I think people don't do that nearly enough. They don't realize the power of those alignments and uh, they don't do it. And so I'm just curious, how, how has, has that happened to you? If so, how has that um, affected you, you know, in a, in your, in your career? I think that the first time the, the, when you have a problem that is a, not a roof leak, the, the, the first time you dispatch it, the, the person that is trying to fix that leak is not skilled or knowledgeable enough to know the difference and they're going to say they fixed something and in fact they haven't and we'll pay for it and then it's going to happen again and we'll pay for it again and when it happens a third time we're then going to try to get someone's attention we, we need to and greg has used this term with me we need to send someone who's smarter someone with a little more experience someone that knows what they're doing and once you do that uh, it could go either way. 
it could it could you you might have the person like you say that'll that'll say you know we don't we don't think it's the roof you might have the person that's still going to try to solve it um, maybe because they think they can or maybe just i don't know um so does that answer your question yeah i, I think it, <laughs> yeah. It, it heightens it heightens the the reality of how you guys feel when you're dealing with contractors who don't do it right and you're paying two three times whether it's a thousand or two thousand dollars and it's still not fixed and then somebody claims to do it and then it happens again that is very uh frustrating and painful and uh i could see i could see why uh you just are the tolerance is like we just want somebody who's smart who knows what they're doing demonstrate that um, yeah, and and the, the the first project that i did for frank the one that he alluded to earlier it wasn't the roof it was something else right and most of the time if you have a competent roofer out there and he's been out there more than once if he's out there if you're getting ready to go for the third time it's probably not the roof and um at least from my perspective it's the roofer's job to find the problem. If it's the wall, find it. If it's the if it's the windows, find it. If it's the sprinkler system that's leaking, find it. Find it. And there's the value that goes goes to Frank. When it, it, even if if the roofer can't fix it himself, but he say, hey, this unit's this mechanical unit is frozen up like a popsicle. You got to get an HVAC guy out here or whatever. That's very helpful. There, there's another question that has. Can I switch gears a little bit here? As soon as you do that, while you're preparing for that question, this is why salespeople. I want you to ask. What have you tried to do to fix it? Why didn't it work? Why don't you think it worked? Like, that's why you ask these questions because you may save yourself from losing an entire account by doing what they would have done and just giving some blanket free consulting or advice. You could have, you can make your job a lot easier and they feel understood and you actually have a chance to do it right. You got to ask questions. Okay, go ahead, Greg. Yeah, so um, Jake asked a uh, question for Frank. Frank. Do you like having lunches, um, treats, gift cards from your vendors as a way to show appreciation? Or how much do you like, or what do you like to have people to show appreciation? And how much is too much? Good question. Um, it, it doesn't have much value to me. Um, it's, it's time spent that I don't have more often than not, or um you know it could could become a conflict of interest with my employer it's just no yeah <laughs> right i knew i knew what the answer was going to be uh yeah. it's yeah. inspection that shows every problem that you know you don't even know is coming yet or you'd rather have something that can help you bring value to your to your tenants um jason has asked a question and frank um you can be vague with this but the question is, um, uh, Frank, you mentioned there are situations where you don't have control over the complete control over the decision process. So what is the process when choosing a roofer or repair estimate? How often do you speak with a prospective roofer regarding a leak? How uh, does someone get your attention uh, to even get to speak uh, uh, with you to convey their experience or knowledge regarding roof related issues? I look, I work for a relatively large corporation. And so we, we have a process established that uh, decides which roofers are going to be called. And I'm not the decision maker when it comes to that process. So that, that's a fine answer. And, and so I would just suggest to uh, the gentleman that asked the question is if you actually get someone like Frank on the phone, ask him what that decision process is and go from there. No, that's in our, ask sales, questions. Process. In our sales process, by the way, folks. Oh, I, I, yes. <laughs> it just feels um, good to validate this in the middle of a, a webinar like this because um, it's, it's important. Yeah, it's good. So here, here's another question for Frank that I do think is, is a great question. Frank, how much of the business, how much, how many of the relationships that you have developed over the years with vendors have come to you via a cold call? And, and to the degree that that has occurred, how, what caught your attention? Uh, 
you know, it's, I would say not, not as many as uh, the ones that, that I've gotten as a result of a, of a referral, probably, uh, you know, someone's reputation. Um, I just yesterday we were, we were in Salt Lake city and this wasn't roof related, but we, we, we had a vendor that we trusted, um, who, uh, we were looking for a different kind of vendor. And we asked him if he knew someone that, you know, who, who we ought to be talking to. Um, it's, it's actually pretty rare that I would develop a, a, a relationship with someone from a cold call. It's extremely rare. That's good. And does I was an exception. You were one of the, <laughs> you might be the only, I, I, candidly, you, you are the only exception I can think of. Well, well, the reality is, Frank, is, I mean, that's because of your trust and experience, but if someone's brand new to their career as a property manager, they may be more open to yes. that early until yes. they build up that trust network. And um, we're talking about you as a, as a experienced high, I mean, what would they categorize you as uh, the type of property manager, like um, for the categories, right? Like you're, you're managing this type of building, like the standards are a certain height, there's a certain value in the market. Um, you're not the cheapest, right? Like that type of thing. So anyway, where do you guys hang out to network and build trusted relationships? Is it just through organic osmosis or do you find value in the BOMA, IFMA type of networking groups and your people with your, in your organization, is there value in those organizations? And is that a place where actually you would say, hey, this is at least getting contractors in the circle of peripheral for us to even consider i've never been part of boma uh, there was there there has been a person in our organization that was part of it and i think that she did um get some relationships from that i i, I can't judge the value of those kinds of relationships um you know my, my world is scattered geographically uh, it's uh it, it's not it's not the little click of a of a meeting of 50 people and and i'm gonna you know get recommendations from them i'm i'm going to uh I'll, i would say that if if i were to pick up a new property i would go to that market i would look for other properties that look like what I want mine to be Good. and find out who's working on those properties. That would be a starting place mm. and go from there. And then the, 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 the vendors that, that I work with that I find that I can trust, find that deliver value. Those are the ones that I'm going to be talking to. Who, 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 who do you use for this? Who should I be talking to for that? Yeah. So powerful. One big takeaway for me is like this free trial run. Like, give me, let me, let me give you a free trial. Let me, you know, process. <laughs> it's pretty powerful. Um, this is good, Frank. I appreciate your, you taking your time. Help. This has been very helpful. Greg, do you have another question? Uh, or um, I'm looking at the chat box and I'm answering some of them uh, mm -hmm. for some, just answering some of these. Um, uh, I, Frank, I you'll. I have one real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. What do you have numbers on service? budgets uh about uh, on these types of cams and you know this the, this uh the budgets what percentage typically falls in different categories like how much is roofing even within your budget typically uh in general compared to the rest of the budget um is it a large or small part you mentioned it being small but i'm just curious like getting numbers in my mind of What's the actual, what's the lion's share of your budget typically, you know, of uh, maintaining your buildings? It represents more in terms of dollars than it does in time. Yeah. Um, it, it does represent time. It, it's going to depend on the age of the roof uh, sure. for specific property, you know, brand new roofs, brand new buildings don't obviously require as, as much. Um, I, I think that, 
you know, as a, as a company, our, one of our processes is to look at um, our entire portfolio, which, which properties are costing us most on a per square foot basis for roof maintenance. And those are our, our, our top targets for replacement. Um, I don't think I've answered your question directly, but um, you know, if it has any value, I would say on average, our shopping centers are gonna be a couple hundred thousand square feet. The budget for roof repairs might be 15,000-ish. Um, that's an average. And compare that to the other, you know, let's say age buildings typically every year. Is that more or less than, than most of the other trades that are being, that you're asking to help you? Less, um, you know, a landscaper that for that same property will, will pay 50. I mean, we, we, <laughs> interestingly, we often pay, pay another 50 just for the water to run through the irrigation on landscaping. Um, and I would say commonly, we pay more for the water to irrigate our landscaping than we do for the roofing. Um, lighting, uh, lighting repairs, we probably would spend a similar amount to what we do for roofing. Uh, security, we might spend zero, we might spend half a million dollars. I mean, that just depends on the type of center. Um, trying to think of what else what other trades mechanical plumbing we don't do a lot of mechanical we don't have a lot of plumbing you know the tenants are responsible for their own hvac their own plumbing so that's it's not ours painting i'd say we spend less for painting than we do for roofing mm-hmm it's good. It's helpful. It's helpful because if I'm a roofer, I'm thinking I want I want to find the best landscapers and lighter lighting companies in town because if they're, you know, just in terms of strategic partnerships and alliances in the market. So, Greg, you got anything uh, for us? Thanks for thanks. For uh, we're about out of time. Um, um, I have attempted to answer most of these questions. I have not gotten to all of them. Um, but for those, some of you know me and you just email me and I'll be glad to give you an answer if I did not answer them. Um, Frank, I want to thank you very much for taking your time out of your schedule. Um, I owe you this over all these years of, of help that you've given me. You, thank you. You, you, owe, you owe me <laughs> nothing. You know that the, the, you're doing this because you're a friend and you've become a friend because we've trusted each other and we've built a sound relationship and we respect each other. And, um, um, but I, I owe you a lunch, so it, it, it'll, it'll come your way when I'm in your hometown at some point. Um, Very good. Ryan. Yeah, Frank, I think I'll speak on behalf of everybody else. Uh, thank you for taking the time. It's very rare that they get the chance to do this other than them asking a property manager themselves, these types of questions. So very, very helpful. And, um, yeah, I hope it was, wasn't too painful for you. So thank you. All right. Thanks guys. Yeah. Thank you very much, Frank. All right. Bye. Thanks, Ryan. Got it. See you, everybody. See you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.